Welcome to Tips from Trestle. This podcast is dedicated to discussing the senior living industry with a unique focus on food, hospitality, and leadership. I'm your host, Aaron Fish. As a 25-year veteran of the hospitality industry, I've focused my work on creating exceptional experiences for the customers we serve. My goal for this podcast? Educate, inform, and inspire leaders in senior living to bring food and hospitality to the front of mind in our industry. Let's bring the innovative and passionate spirit of hospitality to everything that we do. For the residents, families, guests, and employees we serve each and every day. So what are we waiting for? Let's get to it. Today on Tips from Trestle, I'm joined by Lo Hornbuckle. Lo is the CEO and founder of Sage Oak Assisted Living and Memory Care. Founded in 2015, Sage Oak isn't just another assisted living company. They are the boutique assisted living company with five locations in Dallas and a total of 40 beds. Sage Oak provides small, intimate home settings that allow those who need a little extra care to receive the love and dignity that they deserve. Lo, thanks for joining me today on Tips from Trestle. Yeah, glad glad to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me to be on the show. Absolutely. So I want to give uh, the listeners a little bit of background as to why and how we got connected, right? Obviously, we're both in the, the Dallas, Fort Worth area uh, and got connected that way. But the model that you've created with Sage Oak uh, is very interesting to me. You know, I was at your open house for Sage Oak of Denton here back in June. And the, the way you've set it up, the way you're approaching uh, the model in general, but hospitality and food service, uh, I found it really unique. Um, it's really m- much aligned with what, uh, you know, I talk about and how I think we should be doing things. And so um, after my tour, I was like, I really want to talk to Lowe and get his kind of his passion, his understanding as to why Say Joke is the way it is versus some of the other assisted living operators out there. So uh, tell us a little bit about your your background, your story in senior living, and tell us how Say Joke is unique and and why. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, you know, I think a lot of like a lot of people, um, you you get into this business for personal reasons, and um, you know, my dad had a had a bad experience on hospice, and I, I don't want to imply that. Um, it was linear, right? I, I was just, I was in business and I was a salesperson and did some real estate investing. And then your dad gets sick and then, you know, you uh, reflect on things. And, and ultimately I um, <clears throat> just kind of fell into assisted living. Uh, you know, ultimately I probably started off because I thought it was going to be an interesting business. Um, and, you know, had a kind of entrepreneurial fire um, after being an employee for so long. Um, yeah. But I think as soon as I started getting into the business, all those same emotions that I dealt with from my dad passing about a year prior, so my my dad passed in 2014, and we started Say Joke about a year later. Um, so that that really was kind of the impetus for me to kind of get in the business. Um, the thing that that I kind of did sort of accidentally, it's kind of the um, concept called the purple cow, uh, which uh, this the Seth Godin book or whatever, but. Uh-huh. Um, you know, it's basically, I have the mind of a marketer and a salesperson. So I, I always try to design and build products that I think the market wants and needs, right? So rather than trying to build a product and then figure out how to sell it, I think about like, what does the market want and need and just try to build that. Right. And at the time in Dallas, there really wasn't a lot of high-end uh, group homes. Most of the group homes were kind of run down and, you know, maybe 20 years in service and things like that. So initially we kind of got our start. Uh, building what most people consider to be luxury group homes, right? It's, these are really nice ADA architect design group homes. They only hold eight people in Dallas because that's part of um, part of a Dallas city rule that if you're in a residential neighborhood, you're capped at eight residents. And um, there's some fantastic advantages to that model, right? You can imagine why you know eight people being in a home like setting could would be a, a fantastic uh, option for some people. But what we kind of figured out also was is that there are some advantages to scale and some advantages to large buildings, right? right. So yeah. um, ultimately, what you came to see in Denton was our answer to that. That's kind of the evolution of what we started. So we cut our teeth in the group home business, managing a portfolio at one time of six group homes, eight eight uh, eight beds per house, um, and then ultimately. Um, started developing campuses. So instead of having a bunch of group homes spread, spread throughout the city, we have one we have one singular piece of land that has multiple uh, care homes on it. 
And uh, it allows for us to have all the outcomes that you get with a small environment. And I know that we're going to talk a lot about food today. And, and yeah. I think um, you got a chance to experience just how well we can do food in these settings. But um, ultimately, um, there's just so many other advantages to these smaller settings. But we also found a way to capture the scale that comes with being a big building because our total campus is 96 beds with the capacity yeah. for up to 160 beds. So we have all the we have all the revenue and all the amenities and all the things that you typically see in a large facility. But we just have everybody segregated into 16 bed homes, and so that allows for us to have this really great combination of the best of both worlds. So we really do believe this is a better mousetrap and that it's ultimately designed um, to really solve uh, two key problems, which is that um, big buildings are very flawed, right? They have yes. bad physical plans, oftentimes long hallways, often uh, inadequate care uh, staff ratios, right? The food program has challenges, right? Even if you cook amazing meal, the transportation process from getting that food to the residents can be, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes and, and be really difficult. Um, and, and then, you know, and then not only that, but then, you know, when you, when you do a care home or a group home of eight or 10 people, there's a lot of work. You still have to get licensed. You still have to kind of go through all those things. So it's not, um, it's not 10 times as hard to open an 80 bed facility as, as it is to open an eight bed facility. Maybe it's three times as hard, right? So right. we just found that that combination of the two product classes, right? Large setting with, small intimate environments really does check off all the boxes and totally changes the way we're able to sort of approach um, outcome-based um, focuses in, in assisted living and memory care. Yeah. And one of the things I noticed being at the Denton location was you do have, you know, the campus and there's the kind of the, you know, the ability to, to, to have the resources of a large community and provide the services of the smaller one. But I noticed that you know, I think a lot of people would start looking at it as like, especially from a food perspective, is like, oh, well, where's the main kitchen? Where's the main commissary? Because if you're wanting to get those economies of scale, obviously that's one advantage with a, a larger assisted living is you get the one main kitchen, you get a commercial kitchen, to produce a lot of food and feed a lot of people. You guys don't do that with your operations, which I thought was interesting. Can you kind of talk a little bit to us about why you decided not to do that and, and what you think the advantages are for you. Yeah, absolutely. So the, there's, there's probably six or seven things. So we could probably spend the whole show talking about this, but um, so the first thing is when you come on, a, come on the campus of Sage Oak Denton, there's six different um, kitchens. Um, so there's six kitchens, each cooking for 16. So yeah, we could have opted to do, uh, you know, basically a commercial kitchen on the location and then essentially cater uh, to the various places. But um Look, I mean, catering is hard, and uh, transportation of food is is a real uh, is a real challenge. Um, you know, uh, there's very few times that you go get food to go at a restaurant, uh, no matter how nice it is, and the food quality is the same as if you have it in restaurant, right? So, right. Um, the distribution process that that comes with uh, with with a with a centralized kitchen is is very challenging, and it's a real logistics problem. Um, especially if you're taking food to residents in the room, sometimes you got half hour, or 45 minutes. I mean, it's one of the reasons why if you're in the hospital, you're never like, ah, this food's amazing. Cause even if they did a good job with it, it's the transportation process that yeah. kind of kills the quality. So the first thing is just the distribution of food, right? If you cook, we're paying the plate. So we're literally cooking in front of the resident. And then that is then, uh, plated in front of the resident and served to them. And a lot of residents like to sit on the, uh, sit at the, uh, the counter there because we have a central island. Yeah. The other thing that we've noticed is, is that um, it, it has kind of two effects. Um, so for younger folks, it's more like a hibachi experience because they get to watch a chef kind of create and do yeah. things. There's conversation. So whereas in a big building, it's in a commercial kitchen closed off. You can't see the... Um, you can't see, um, you know, the chef or the, the, the meal process in this it's open, right? So you're more, it's more of a performance, but then also too, because of our big Island, it has an effect of making those people feel a bit like they're at a soda counter, right? So think about, you know, like sitting at the, the waffle house or sitting at, you know, a soda counter, um, you know, many years ago, and you kind of have that impact, but it, it, it goes even deeper than that. So, you know, we hired a gentleman, our executive chef from a large, uh, 400, 500 bed independent living, assisted living and memory care community. So he was cooking for about four or 500 people a day Had a staff of 27. And I asked him, I said, how do you, uh, how do you know if the residents like the food? And he said, well, they, they leave comment cards and I check them once a week. I'm like, so if someone hates a meal, you might make an adjustment seven to 10 days later. I said, in our environment, 
if you put the food in front of them and they don't seem to be enjoying it, make them something else. And so there's yeah. instant feedback from the chef. Um, the chef also becomes part of the care team because now they're an extra set of, set of eyes. You know, if they're serving and someone starts to choke, you have an opportunity to take action. Um, they get to know the residents um, on a very personal basis. So they start to know who needs thickener in their liquids, who needs low sodium diet, who's, uh, you know, low sugar because they're diabetic or whatever the case yeah. may be. So there's really a million reasons why, but at the end of the day, um, it's much more like a home, right? Most people are accustomed yeah. to someone cooking in a kitchen, sitting around, visiting, having that kind of social experience. And so we've taken meals as being, you know, basically the preparation of food and turned it into an activity and a communal event. It has instant feedback for the chef. The residents love this experience. So when you walk into Sage Oak home and there's cooking going on, it smells like food. It smells like a home. You know, you wake up in the morning, the coffee's percolating, the bacon sizzling. It's just the whole thing has um, creates that emotional, uh, visceral type of reaction that people have. And you just don't get that when someone's cooking a building away, you know, behind behind closed doors. Yeah. And so it really is, um, from our perspective, I mean, um, you know, look, I, are we going to run the most efficient, um, food numbers? No, but are we going to be able to turn out incredible, uh, meals and incredible, um, moments for residents? Yes. And so ultimately we're trying to, um, try to elevate, um, what happens because, you know, really all we've seen is you've got companies like yours that are going in and trying to add efficiency and, and improve operations. But, most of the places are just like signing like crazy deals, with like, you know, celebrity chefs and stuff. And, and, and it's all kind of gimmicky. But at the end of the day, when you're cooking for, for 200 or 300 people, there's logistical challenges that are hard. And so, um, you know, ultimately we just wanted to reduce the amount of meals. And so I told our chef to give you an idea about kind of what our vision is. I said, you'll know you've peaked as an artist, you know, as a chef artist, when you go around the six homes in Denton, and all six homes have a different menu for that day. And inside the home, um, each house has a substitution or a change on the menu to accommodate someone in that house that may have a low sodium or diabetic need or mechanical soft type of situation. So just think about that for a minute. We actually yeah. want to move away from uniformity and move towards individualization and uh, our model allows us to do that. And look, I don't know if you, that idea that I have in my head that I think is perfection is possible, but right. I aim to find out. And so that's really what we're trying to do is we're trying to basically answer the question, can you truly have a personalized dining experience um, with 16 other, with 15 other people? And right. uh, we think the answer is yes. And uh, so that's really what we've set out to do is really create a, an experience very personal, right? Very um, very individualized. And, and that's really what we think boutique means to us is small personalized experience. Yeah, no, definitely. You know, it's, it's funny that you talked about that individual experience because, you know, one of the things I talk to operators about all the time is, and I think it's missed is, you know, food is such a huge opportunity from a brand awareness, from a revenue generation, from a marketing perspective, you know, you can almost consider your, your food budget as part of your marketing budget. If it's done right, it's going to sell the community. And what you're doing in these smaller homes, like the way you describe it, is exactly that. Like opening the door and kind of getting that, the smell of lunch or breakfast or dinner being made, it, like it's the first thing you, you're you introduced to. You know, I even noticed that when I when I was on site, when I walked in, literally kind of the first thing you see is the kitchen, right? When you come through the doors and, and you come down there and it's it's a great way to to engage the residents and food is so valuable. You know, it's, three touch points a day minimum. Uh, and I think it's what you're doing is, is really great. And so um, one of the things you mentioned, which I was going to ask you about was the menu process, right? So you have a uh, primary chef for the, the campus, but you have other chefs in each location. So do they work off of a kind of a, a base menu and are allowed some freedoms around that kind of, what does your menu process look like? Yeah. So um, the way we're set up is, is that in our six homes, five of the six will be uh, cooked by a cook or a chef. One of them is caregiver prepared, prepared and they have training from the chef. So um, that that's generally going to be, um, you know, so for example, you got somebody that <clears throat> has a, a feeding tube, right? They may want a, a, a less expensive option. They don't necessarily care about the chef, right? If they have a feeding right. tube, for example. So um, we kind of have that house as just being a little less expensive because obviously it's expensive to have, um, you know, that 
uh, that trained chef. Um, and ultimately they're going to generally cook a little bit more complicated, um, harder to execute type of things. I mean, we've served versions of lobster before, uh, you know, right. in, in, in our, in our environment and all kinds of, you know, I know you've got some food pictures, uh, that, yeah, that I sent you that you may uh, work into the show. So, I mean, we're really trying to make it look like, you know, half, half the stuff you see, like, Hey, maybe you'd see that at a Michelin star restaurant in terms of the type of thing you're cooking and things like that. So just very unusual, but, uh, ultimately, um, you know, what, uh, what we're really trying to do is <clears throat> the, the food for us, like you said, is absolutely a marketing piece for us. Um, but on the individualization level, um, we feel strongly that especially the future consumer, right? So if we think about who our customers are now, um, the future consumer, right? Everyone talks about the baby boomers and the silver tsunami. Um, we don't think they're going to want, um, we don't think they're going to want the same types of choices and options. And so we think Sage Oak's kind of future proof from that perspective. So as far as the menu goes, yeah. So the chefs, um, we, what we try to do is try to design a menu around two things, the skills of the person cooking and the preferences of the 16 people in the home. And then we have it reviewed by a nutritionist and then, then that's the menu with substitutions. Um, and so that's basically kind of the gist, um, you know, ultimately um, what we've seen in lots of environments are, is that, you know, if we, we ask people to cook things that aren't in their wheelhouse, they don't turn out as good as they could. Right. right. So, you know, you got a guy from New York trying to make gumbo. It might not go that well. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, ultimately what we want to do is kind of ha- find that Venn diagram of what is our, what is our individual that's cooking? What do they do well? And then what are our resident preferences? And when, then we kind of create that Venn diagram and that really is kind of the basis for the menu. Um, yeah. And so um, it's interesting because, you know, one of the, re- one of the ways that somebody could choose, cause you know, like I said, we have six houses on the campus. So like, how would you choose which house to go to? Well, one of the ways someone would do that is potentially their food preferences. So if we're like, Hey, this house is Catholic and does fish on Friday, would you like to be part of that? And they go, yeah, I would love to do fish on Friday. Um, or, you know, uh, this house loves spicy food. Would you want to be in the spicy food house? So, um, it, it, you know, there's so many different ways you can curate residents in our setting, right? You can curate them yeah. based on, you know, mental acuity, physical ability, um, types of things they're interested in. You could even have a language, a shared language, right? You could have a house that catered to people that were primarily Vietnamese, for example, and you had a Vietnamese chef cooking food, right? So you can do all those different, um, different, uh, different types of curation with your, with your residents. But, you know, one of the easiest is to say, Hey, like, what do you enjoy eating? this house eats a lot of those types of foods. This, this house over here eats a lot of those types of foods. And so they could make a decision based on that versus, you know, do you prefer house number three or house number four? It's kind of random, but if you yeah. actually make it where they're a little different then it then allows for people to choose. And maybe if their palate changes, they can transfer or, Hey, I can't eat spicy foods anymore or whatever the case may be. So yeah. it really is for us. It really is all about just trying to create this unique experience so that, if we were to ask, you know, 20 people, like, what do you like about say joke? We might get 20 different answers because say joke is something different to each person. And that's really what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. I, when you said the differentiating and letting kind of people like self-select where to go, the first thing that popped in my mind was you're running six restaurants on your campus every day and they have the ability to kind of ebb and flow with the resident population. And I think when, you know, I think about trying to create unique experiences and being able to let a resident who maybe wants that to choose where to go and then have the ability to kind of flex back and forth. I think that's a a really great way to approach it. And it's definitely a differentiator in the market for sure. So one of the other things I was curious about was um, the, the hiring and staffing, because you mentioned, you know, maybe you've got a chef who you know, is really good at like, your example, Vietnamese food. How do you identify those chefs? Do you, do you try to, you know, fill a house and then staff it? Or do you, do you kind of do it halfway? Like, what does that approach look like given kind of the way you approach the uniqueness of, of each location? Yeah, no, great question. I mean, I think, I think it's the same thing with any business. The larger you are, the more specialized someone can be. The smaller you are, um, the more well-rounded you need people to be. Yeah. You know, so right now we've got a guy that's got a lot of range that's our executive chef. Um, and so, 
he'll probably wind up cooking three or four days a week. So he'll be assigned to a house and will actually be cooking, right? Not just, you know, in, back in an office somewhere. And um, he's got a great demeanor, military background. So uh, we just think he's just, he's kind of unflappable. So he, he, we think he's just really great in dementia care. Cause mind you, we're cooking an open kitchen with, with residents with dementia, right? So that has a whole element to it that yeah. um, other people haven't, haven't dealt with, but um, you know, so right now, um, what we do is we've been really fortunate, honestly, if you were to guess the number of people we got applied for our executive chef, you'd probably get it wrong. We had like 250 people apply, um, for our executive chef position. So we haven't had the, some of the labor challenges in this particular setting that people have seen for. And I think it's probably a combination of, we offer better hours than, than most assisted living and memory care places. Right. Because the way we can kind of do it is you can kind of cook from seven to like two thirty or three, and then you can, you can, you can make dinner and then leave heating instructions for the caregivers. You don't have to work those 12 hour shifts necessarily to be a chef in a sage oak environment. Um, but then secondarily, um, most people, uh, get into cooking cause they like cooking and they like yes. watching people enjoy food yes. and, and, and they get so far away from that. Right. And that sometimes they make something amazing and they don't really know. And the only way they know is that people are like, Oh yeah, everyone really loved it. They were very complimentary, but like, it's just, you're getting, it's like, it's like second degree, right. Versus like yeah. sitting there and watching someone enjoy food. And, and um, you know, we're, we're kind of working on a campaign right now um, called food is memory. And what we'd like to do is um, have residents have family members, if, if residents not able to kind of talk to us about like, what are something that your parents loved in their childhood they haven't had in a long time and then trying to recreate that. And so if, the, and, and so that way we cook it. So tonight is, you know, Mary's favorite pasta, you know, when she yeah. was younger and then now she can has this experience. And now the other residents can kind of have a taste of, you know, Mary's history and Mary's childhood. But, you know, food is so interesting because, you know, if you ever really want to tell a story, you know, like, cooking is like a form of storytelling. Yeah. And, and so, um, we just really want it front and center. Right. So I, I don't, I'm not, I'm like, I'm like one of those foodies that doesn't cook. I love food. <laughs> I love thinking about food. Yeah. I have strong opinions about food. I can't cook anything at all. Yeah. Um, but you know and so I, yeah, <laughs> well, I know it tastes good. And I also know, um, I, I know when, I know when somebody, you know, it's like you can watch art in anything, right? You know, yeah. there's race car drivers, they're just in the flow and you're like, man, that guy's an artist or that that woman's an artist. And, you know, I think I think chefs are kind of at that sort of they're at that place where like science and art kind of come together, right? There's obviously yeah. you know, food safety things. There's obviously science that comes in with uh, cooking and preparation of things. But then you also have this creativity side where you can do these different things. And so. Um, letting that process kind of play out in front of the residents and letting the residents have almost like a democratic process. You know, we, we even had them say like, oh, that's not how you make gumbo. This is how we make gumbo. Like, OK, we'll have a gumbo off next week or whatever the case may be. So it's just it's just a totally different experience. And, um, yeah. you know, and if you really think about it, um, you, you know, you said running restaurants and you know, that is one perspective. Um, I would think um, really I, I look at it like we've got it's like a dinner party, you know, it's like yeah. you go to a chef's house for a dinner party and there's just six of those happening on our campus. Um, and that's really what it's like. Um, yeah. because we're, you know, with, with a restaurant, you have a pretty wide menu. Mars are going to be more narrow throughout the day, but you know, you go to a chef's house, like, Hey, this is what we're having for dinner. And you're like, great. And you're just like, you know, having conversation and you know, that's, that's kind of what, I think of it as, and yeah. so for us, it's almost like Thanksgiving every day, right? You've got 16 to 20 people in a house together and, and, you know, if you sleep in, we'll, we'll heat something up for you, you know, so it's just a different experience than you'd get in, in a big building. And so it's just really kind of exciting to really see this process play out. Cause I've, I've done assisted living and memory care for a long time without having the chef. Right. And right. so um, to open Lake Charles and open Denton, the scaling that that gives me allows us to really get, you know, get out, get out ahead of the food game. And so I, I think ultimately um, we're trying to be true to our motto, which is just great care, great food, great communication. And, uh, you know, we really had to elevate what we wanted to do to really be in the, the great food category. And, and um, I think we've, I think we're onto something that is going to be impactful. Right. And um, yeah. our hope is, is that um, people will appreciate you know, look, you can tell when a business cares about something. And so, like you said, we could have one commercial kitchen and be transporting the food. We yeah. chose to have six kitchens, right? So I have, you know, 
two, I mean, I have six times and 12 times and, 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 and all this numbers of things that I could probably have in one central place. Um, but we do that because that pan to plate process, the openness, the, the soda counter, the Benihana effect, you know, the hibachi yeah. grill yeah. effect. We just can't replicate that in a, in a commercial kitchen. No, the dinner party analogy, I think, makes a lot of sense because you're right. It's like, hey, chef's at it. Let's go over to his house. And that's basically absolutely created. That's that's a really good analogy. Um, we're getting close on time, but I was curious to ask you with your open kind of kitchen concept. Do you have a lot of engagement from residents wanting to be a part of not just the dining experience, but the actual cooking experience as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we designate those areas as staff areas, um, but um, th there's actually uh, kind of the way the kitchen set up is there's, there's four fridges, two are behind the counter, two are open for residents. And yeah, residents will participate. I mean, one of the things, um, uh, one of the, uh, one of the few things that's kind of interesting is that um, when we assess a resident, um, for example, not every resident gets a pendant, right? Because if you're not cognitively aware on how to use a pendant, you might push it a bunch of times or you might never push it, right? So both are bad. So um, because we're so individualized, we kind of go in and be like, all right, well, could this person cook safely? Could this person participate in this? And, you know, if their care plan allows them to do so, they may not, you know, necessarily handle another resident's food or anything because they haven't necessarily been trained on that, but they can, they can do things and they can kind of stand over the chef's shoulder and then kind of have conversations and they can help, you know, set out the flatware and help set up the things. And, um, it's not uncommon at all, um, in dementia care to see, um, domestic duty to be calming, right? So we do this with all kinds of things in dementia care, right? So sometimes you'll have a resident help you fold laundry and then, you know, they're like, okay, they just, they, they, they it's it, a lot of, a lot of people did domestic duties. And so if they're on a journey through time, then, you know, having that opportunity to kind of participate. So yeah, we have residents do that often and, and, um, you know, we have them oversee the process and weigh in and give their opinion. Oh, why did you add that? What well, that of this? And so it really is, it is, it is a bit like a dinner party because, you know, sometimes you'll have, you know, chef having a dinner party and then someone will be standing over their shoulder like, oh, this is interesting. Why did you go with this choice versus this choice? And so, yeah, we do see a lot of that, um, especially in um, our South Louisiana community, um, just because everybody, you know, South Louisiana is just such a food mecca, right? Yeah. And so there's yeah. just so much stuff going on down there. So everyone has like really strong opinions about you know, Cajun food. And so oh, this is not black enough. This is not spicy enough. This gumbo, that roux is not dark enough. And so that, that, you know, we, it's nearly an, it's nearly an HR problem. You can only tell a chef <laughs> how to do gumbo so many times yeah. where he's like, I will not stand for this abuse. Right. Anymore. Especially so, in Louisiana. I can only that's imagine. Right. That, um, no, I, you know, like I said at the start, the, the model, you know, I, I talked to a potential client early on who is, was, developing something like this or talking about it. And, and one of the things that I talked to them about was all the unique experiences that they could create. And I didn't think that they maybe quite got it. They, you know, they were really just kind of focused on, oh, well, we'll build like one house and then maybe we'll do another. And I think the approach you've got of let's, let's build this thing big, but let's find the, and find the economies of scale where it makes sense. But then let's put the unique experiences of the small house where it makes sense. You know, say joke, kind of like you said, I think it, it really does find that niche in the market. And, and I really think you guys are going to have a lot of success. So as we kind of wrap up, Lo, is there anything else that you want to want to share about say joke? And uh, how can we uh, how can listeners contact you or reach out to and learn more about say joke? Yeah, sure. So, um, no, just, uh, you know, I think uh, we're, we're a company that's trying to innovate and, and change, you know, so we're always changing, we're always growing, we're always adapting. Um, I think I've kind of been of the opinion that um, healthcare in general has had a lot of problems in America for a long time. Mm -hmm. And um, so we just want to be, you know, a part of a small change that people can actually get the things that they get promised on these tours and, and by these, these marketing folks out there in the marketplace. Um, uh, if they want to learn more about our Dallas operation, um, that website is the sageoak.com, T-H-E-S-A-G-E-O-A-K.com. And then our Denton operation is the sageoakdenton.com. So pretty easy to find. Um, we're just on the east, northeast uh, section uh, in Denton uh, near the intersection of 288 and 380. And then our Dallas properties are all centrally located 
uh, you know, all inside the 635 loop, you know, kind of 75230 zip code. And we have another one that's over by White Rock Lake. So all very central uh, Dallas. Check us out there if you want to learn more. And uh, we're happy to, uh, you know, talk with you about a loved one or for yourself if, uh, you know, you want an elevated food experience. Because while the show is focused on food, um, there's a lot of things that this community does well in terms of fall reduction. Yeah. You know, obviously dealing with people with uh, with, with memory issues or, or dementia is obviously a big part of that. And then obviously we've, um, we're fortunate enough to win an architecture and design award from senior housing news. And one of the keys is our, our footprint of our buildings allow for people that have mobility challenges to really navigate the building very easily. Yeah. And so there's a lot of things we do. Well, I know this, the show is, is food focused and we could talk about food for hours. Yeah. I'd be very happy, <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's a lot of advantages to the model beyond, uh, beyond Absolutely. just food. Yeah, no. And you can see it by walking. So yeah, I would encourage anybody to go take a tour, check it out because it, it's a really cool, innovative way that you guys are, are providing, you know, senior living services. So well, it means a lot coming from you. You've seen a lot of, you've seen a lot of operations and a lot of spaces. So to, 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 for that uh, hat tip to come from you, means a lot. So thank you. Yeah, no, definitely. So Lo, I appreciate all your time talking with us today. And uh, thanks again for joining me on tips from Trestle. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So there you have it. Another one in the books. Thanks again, everybody, for listening. You can follow or direct message me on LinkedIn, where I'm always commenting and posting about food, hospitality, and leadership for the senior living industry. Or give me a follow on Twitter at AHFish or Instagram at Aaron H. Fish. And check out my company, Trestle Hospitality Concepts, at www.trestlehospitalityconcepts.com. I'm your host, Aaron Fish, and this has been another episode of Tips from Trestle.